Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Alan Levinson. I'm the Schusterman Josie Chair of Jewish History. And on behalf of uh, Professor Yael Lavender Smith, who's sitting here and uh, right here, uh, uh, we want to welcome you uh, uh, to this, uh, the fourth of four presidential dream course lectures connected to our class, The Artist's Bible. Uh, I want to just congratulate you all on making it to the end of what turned out to be a longish semester. If uh, you're a student, this is probably your last class day. If you're a professor, you have probably also one class day and one week of grading uh, to look forward to. I hope everybody is in good spirits and I hope everybody learned a lot and taught a lot and uh, uh, did what we're supposed to do at the university. So um, congratulations, maybe give yourselves a little applause. Why not? Why not? It's a lot. Of, it's a lot of work to do it right. Um, I want to uh, uh, welcome also the people online. Uh, we uh, I can't see who you are, uh, and I'm going to say a word about that. We had uh, some Zoom bombing, uh, actually quite a lot of Zoom bombing uh, last week when Professor Samantha Baskin spoke, and we've had a uh, on and off problem with it this semester. Uh, it's really quite um, upsetting uh, uh, to have uh, jerks uh, interrupt, uh, interrupt uh, invited lecturers, uh, colleagues uh, with um, stupidity, pornographic imagery. This is really uh, uh, very uncivil. And uh, all I can say is I'm sorry uh, that if you were here last week and, and online and, and saw that, I apologize uh, for the behavior of idiots as uh, uh, since we have a couple of philosophers in the audience, I think it's Schiller who said, against idiocy, even the gods strive in vain and we are not even minor deities. So um, I, uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, so um, we can't see, uh, can't see you online, but uh, you can put post your uh, questions uh, in the Q and A box, and after we'll take your questions along with everyone else who's here in person. Uh, I want to uh, uh, I want to also uh, just take a couple of minutes to thank some people, especially this is our our last um, presidential dream course uh, lecture of the semester. I want to thank um, I want to thank always uh, Trice Hyman, our very able uh, administrative support special assistant of the Schusterman Center. We gave him a very long title uh, for coordinating <laughs> in lieu of a proper raise. <laughs> but uh, but um, uh, we're awfully uh, appreciative of his uh, uh, consistently superb efforts. Um, I want to uh, thank our history department chair, Alyssa Faison, and our um, uh, deans, uh, David Robel of the College of Arts and Science. Man, talk about 10 seconds after I thank her. Okay, here's Professor, I'm gonna do it again. I was the thing, no, no, I'm, this is what happens when you're OCD, you start your intros too early. Uh, this is Professor Alyssa Faison. Chair of uh, History, we're very thankful uh, for her support, for the support of Dean David Robel of the College of Arts and Science, and Dean Corey Phelps, for uh, the uh, Dean of the College of uh, Business, for their support and letting yeah, L and I team teach this class. Uh, we thank, of course, the President's uh, Office for their support and every Presidential Dream Course for the last 20 or so years. Uh, if you, uh, now that semester is really winding down, you want to kill five, 10 minutes, it's actually kind of fun. Just go take a look on the provost website as to all the presidential dream courses that have been given here at OU in the last a couple of decades. It really is pretty impressive. Uh, and uh, uh, fourth, and uh, by no means least, I really, really want to thank um, our partners here at the Fred Jones Jr. Museum of Art. Uh, I see Hadley's here, the curator, and Amanda's here, the education director, and last week, Thomas uh, Smith, the director, was able to introduce uh, Samantha 
Uh, and I just think um, it was uh, really a great piece of fortune uh, that um, we uh, met before this course began. And it's been a wonderful partnership and I'm very grateful. And I know I speak for Yael as well uh, for uh, setting up the, uh, uh, the room upstairs with some of the pieces we talked about much the most and about affording us classrooms when we had classes here. So uh, it was really, a, a, has been a great partnership. So finally, uh, please uh, silence or turn off your cell phones. Uh, and when we do get to the Q&A part, keep your cues concise and let Professor Nadler provide the A's. Okay. When he comes up here, you'll see him because he's, much taller than I am. Professor Stephen Nadler is the Villa Research Professor and William H. Hay Professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he also directs the Institute for Research in the Humanities. His research, wide-ranging research, focus, focuses on philosophy, history of philosophy, and art history, especially but not limited to the 17th century. He has written extensively on Descartes, Cartesianism, Spinoza, and Leibniz. His many publications include Spinoza, A Life, which is the definitive biography of Benedict Baruch Spinoza, everybody's fave, The Best of All Possible Worlds, A Story of Philosophers, God, and Evil, A Book Forged in Hell, Spinoza's Scandalous Treatise and the Birth of the Secular Age, the Philosopher, the Priest, and the Painter, a portrait of Descartes, Heretics, the Wondrous and Dangerous Beginnings of Modern Philosophy. He has held professorships everywhere you would want to hold one. And in 2020, he was elected a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. His expertise in art history is evident in many places uh, and very stunningly evident in Rembrandt's Jews, a piece of detective work, historical analysis, and lucid writing that was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Our students this morning discovered what I had uh, heard through the grapevine, uh, that Professor Nadler is a teacher full of wit and wisdom. Uh, and without further ado, please give a warm OU welcome to Professor Stephen Nadler. Thank you. Um, can we turn down some of these, try some of these lights to make the images um, look a little bit better up there? Perfect, thanks. So tonight we're gonna to talk about two of the major personalities of the Dutch Republic in the 17th century often called the Dutch Golden Age, but that term is now very disputed for good reasons because the Golden Age was not golden for everybody. Um, there was a good deal of poverty. Um, the Dutch were heavily involved in the um, capture and um, uh, transportation of enslaved people. Um, but nonetheless, the term still gets used although a lot of museums are rethinking, rethinking it. The first personality um, will need no introduction. This is Rembrandt, a self-portrait um, rather um, late middle age, 1659, um, right around the time that he was forced into bankruptcy and had to sell his house. I got to time this, make sure you don't go over. Um, and part of what I want to talk about, uh, Rep, uh, Rembrandt was born in Leiden in 1609, uh, 1606, he died in Amsterdam in 1669. Um, part of what I want to talk about tonight is a very popular mythology about Rembrandt. And that's the, the notion that he was a great lover of the Jewish people. He had a deep sympathy and understanding of Jewish history, a fascination with Jewish themes, uh, and somehow had this empathy for um, Judaism and the Jews. A lot of it is mythology based on misunderstandings of the titles of a lot of his paintings, uh, for example, this very well-known painting, often called The Jewish Bride um, from circa 1665, but the title was not given to the painting until the 18th century by a French dealer 
Um, and most of the titles of Rembrandt's paintings that ostensibly have Jewish themes, these were not titles given to them by Rembrandt. So you'll see a painting um, or a drawing called Portrait of a Jew, Portrait of an Old Jew, Portrait of a Rabbi, Young Jewish Man. Um, we have no evidence whatsoever that these are portraits of Jews or that Rembrandt was even using Jewish models if they were just anonymous genre paintings. So there's a good deal of mythology around Rembrandt on this topic as there is on Rembrandt among many other topics. What we do know for certain though, is that Rembrandt lived in the middle of Amsterdam's Jewish quarter. Um, this street here is the St. Anthony's Maestat on St. Anthony's Broad Street, but even in the mid 1600s, it was called the Jodebrestraat, the Jews Broad Street. And that's because um, along this street, many of these homes were owned or rented. Got it. Okay, so if, uh, thanks. <laughs> um, if you were to walk along that street, you would pass many homes that were owned or rented by uh, Jews, mostly Portuguese and Spanish Jews. And I'll come back to them in a second. Um, the district was also home to Amsterdam's art world. And a lot of those homes, uh, both before the Jews moved in and while they were living there were owned by artists, um, art dealers or very wealthy art patrons. That square island you see at the top, the Vloyenburg Island, um, was also home to a large Jewish population, but these tended to be the poorer Ashkenazic Jews who started settling in Amsterdam around the 1640s. Um, the red arrow is pointing to what is now the Rembrandt House Museum, and it was indeed Rembrandt's house. Um, and that's the reason he went bankrupt because he couldn't afford it. He paid way too much more than he can afford. Um, and so less than two year, uh, 20 years after buying it, he had to sell it and move to a different part of the city. Who were these Jews um, along the Jordan Reistrat and in the Vloyenburg? They were mostly former conversos, that is um, Jews or, uh, well, conversos or former conversos, that is Jews who while in Spain and Portugal had been forced to convert to Christianity. Uh, by 1492, after um, Ferdinand and Isabella had conquered most of the Spanish territories, they proclaimed that all Jews within the land and also all Muslims either had to convert to Christianity or leave. So a fair number did convert. They were then known as conversos or the um, old Christians called them, uh, the, use the derogatory term, Moranos, which means swine. Um, they were also called new Christians. Um, those who didn't convert fled to Portugal. Unfortunately, just six years later, the Portuguese, with the, with the union of the Spanish kingdom and the Portuguese territory, um, the Jews then in Portugal were also told to convert or leave, but they were not allowed to leave. So they were also forced to convert to Christianity. The Inquisition came down very hard on these conversos because they didn't trust the sincerity of their conversion. Um, the Inquisition did not care if you were Jewish, it cared if you were a bad Christian. Jews and Muslims were infidels, non-believers, and technically outside the domain, outside the authority of the Inquisition. But conversos who may have been practicing Judaism in secret, these were heretics, and the Inquisition took a very deep interest in whether you were a heretic or not. And so over the following subsequent decades, uh, both in Spain and Portugal, the Spanish and Portuguese inquisitions um, persecuted these conversos, so much so that many of them decided that they, sh they needed to leave. And they um, took flight both along the Northern African coast and along, uh, many of them fled into France. Um, many of them ended up in Venice, Hamburg, Salonika, but also Antwerp, because that was a better place to continue their businesses. These were well-connected merchants dealing especially in the trade of sugar um, with the Caribbean and South American lands, um, but they were also dealing with um, textiles, uh, spices, dried fruit. Spinoza's family was importing um, dried apricots and, and raisins. Um, and so Antwerp, if you were a, a merchant in Northern Europe, Antwerp was the place to be. 
Unfortunately, Antwerp was still under Spanish dominion, so it was not a place to be Jewish. So these conversos maintained their ostensible um, Christian um, exteriors in Antwerp. Maybe some of them were practicing Judaism in secret. By the 1570s and 1580s especially, life in Antwerp became very difficult because the Dutch provinces, Holland, Utrecht, and the other provinces, had um, started, began their revolt against their Spanish, uh, the Spanish king. And so Antwerp was embargoed by the Dutch. There was now a division between those Dutch provinces that were under revolt and those Dutch speaking provinces in the Southern Netherlands that were still under Spanish control. And so the Dutch closed off the Scheldt River. Um, Antwerp really then took an economic dive and a lot of, uh, a great deal of the Antwerp population, not just uh, diamond traders, um, sorry, not diamond traders, uh, sugar merchants, salt, dried fruit, spices, and so on, but also uh, textile merchants and artists all fled north. And that's why uh, Harlem and Leiden became great centers of the textile industry. A lot of these conversos in Antwerp settled in Amsterdam and Amsterdam now became the flourishing um, a cosmopolitan entrepot of Northern Europe. And so the conversos who settled in Amsterdam tend to live in this new part of the city. The city was expanding. And so housing here was cheap. Uh, Amsterdam was a relatively tolerant place, unless you were Catholic, and didn't yet openly welcome Jews, but allowed them to settle with a wink. There's a story, um, I told it to this cl the class this morning, that one day the Amsterdam sheriff was walking past a house and he heard um, some strange language being um, coming out of the basement. And uh, he and his men said, ah, we, we, we caught a bunch of Catholics practicing a Latin mass. So they burst into the room and arrested everybody. And when it was explained that in fact, the sounds that they heard were not Latin, but Hebrew, and that the, it was not a mass, but um, a Jewish ceremony, everyone was released with apologies. So they were allowed to settle both along that street and in the Vloyenburg district. Um, eventually they were welcomed more openly and by 1675, as we'll see, they were able to build a big new synagogue. And those of you who have been, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna walk over there. Uh, at the end of the street, if you've been to Amsterdam, you visited the Portuguese synagogue. It's still there, it's a magnificent building. So Rembrandt lived right in the heart of the Jewish quarter. And when he walked out his door, he was able to see Jews walking in the street. These are not Portuguese Jews. This is not how the Portuguese Jews dressed. These are most likely Ashkenazic Jews who began settling in greater numbers in the 1640s and 1650s, late 1630s, as they were fleeing pogroms, uh, both in the German lands, in Lithuania, later in Lithuania and Poland. Um, and these are the Jews who tended to settle on that island up there. There really was no love lost between the Sephardic or Portuguese Jews and the Ashkenazic Jews. Um, the Sephardic Jews tended to be well-off merchants and professionals, and they were somewhat embarrassed by these poor Jews who were fleeing in from the East. Uh, they did what they could to help them settle, but they also took up a great deal of charitable collections in order to send them back to where they came from um, or somewhere else, but not in Amsterdam. They were embarrassed in front of the Dutch by, these, by the Ashkenazic Jews. Among Rembrandt's neighbors was a rabbi. This is our other main character tonight. Um, this is Rabbi Manasseh ben Israel, um, probably somebody who does need an introduction to most of you. This is not Manasseh ben Israel despite the fact that in the 18th century, this Rembrandt etching was given the title Portrait of Manasseh ben Israel. We don't know who this is, um, but if you pursue, if you go online and look for pictures of Manasseh ben Israel, this is what you'll get. But most scholars agree that this is not Manasseh. Um, we don't even know if this is a rabbi or much less a Jewish individual. This is not Manasseh ben Israel either. If you go online and look up for images of Matt Manasseh in Israel, you'll also get this. This is a painting by Rembrandt's student, Robert Flink, 
Uh, again, we don't have any idea who it is. It might be the same person as this, but might, might not be. Might be a rabbi, might be a Jewish person. We have no idea whatsoever. This is Manasseh ben Israel. Uh, and we know this because it's uh, an, an engraving that appears in some of his works, and it has his name on it. Um, it's obviously not of the same artistic quality as these, but this is the best image we have of Manasseh. Um, Manasseh lived where the blue arrow points, we think, um, on some in the, in the new Hautmark. Hautmark. Um, there was a lot of timber businesses on that island, so you have the, the long, the lange Hauptstadt, the Korte Hauptstadt, the short wood street, the long wood street, the Hautmark, the, the wood market. Um, and that canal separating the two was called the Hautracht, the, the wood canal. Manasseh was one of four rabbis in the Portuguese Jewish community. He was third in rank, um, but by far the least well paid. And he felt throughout his life that he never got the respect he deserved. And I think he was right. He, um, the, the chief rabbi was Saul Levi Mortera, who was actually of Ashkenazic background. He was brought in from Venice because the earliest Portuguese Jewish settlers of Amsterdam really had no idea what Judaism was about because they had all been raised in Catholic environments. Um, they went to Catholic schools. They had been cut off for generations from Jewish texts and Jewish traditions. So they really had no sense of normative Jewish practice. And so the Amsterdam uh, Portuguese community decided that we needed somebody, we needed people to teach us. So they brought in rabbis from Venice, Solevi Mortera, uh, a rabbi from Fez, Morocco, um, Isaac Uziel, um, rabbis from Salonika, rabbis from Hamburg, most of whom were of Portuguese or Spanish background, but nonetheless had been born and educated in Jewish contexts. Manasseh himself was born in Lisbon. Uh, to a converso family and only returned to Judaism when he himself, when his family arrived in Amsterdam. So he was educated by the, uh, the other rabbis who had been brought in from elsewhere. It was a very strange Judaism that was being practiced by the Portuguese community because they had been cut off. And so these rabbis had a very difficult job of trying to get rid of the Catholic elements that had crept into Jewish practice. So, for example, the, uh, the Purim holiday was called the Feast of St. Esther. Um, we know that the rabbis often had to punish members of the community because they were doing things that uh, really were Catholic inheritances from their parents or their grandparents. So it was a tough job being a rabbi among the Portuguese. Was Rembrandt a friend of Manasseh's. This is another one of the myths. So uh, in addition to his alleged great sympathy for the Jewish people, um, you'll often read in books about Rembrandt that he and Manasseh were neighbors. I guess in a loose sense, they were. They were best of friends, um, collaborators. Maybe that's true, we'll see. Um, but were they in fact friends? We have no idea. What we do know is that they did have some common friends, for example, um, Ephraim Bueno was a medical doctor among the Portuguese Jews. And we also know that he was friends with Rembrandt. Um, we have this painting of, of Dr. Bueno by Rembrandt, um, probably to be used for an engraving in one of uh, Dr. Bueno's books. And we also have um, uh, an etching that he did of Bueno. And so perhaps uh, Bueno, who is also very close to Manasseh, he subsidized some of Manasseh's books. Perhaps Bueno was the person who brought them together. If they were brought together, which is the next question I want to pursue, were they collaborators? Well, who was Manasseh? Um, and why would a Rembrandt have had any interest in him? Manasseh was probably the most famous Jew in Europe at the time. Um, it's hard to think of a, you know, a, a contemporary analog. Um, we were talking earlier about Jacob Neusner, who published 4,000 books on Jewish topics, many of them geared for Gentile readers to explain Judaism to them. Um, Manasseh was the go-to person 
in the Republic of Letters in the 17th century if you wanted to know something about Judaism. And he was often consulted by Gentile scholars about what's the Jewish view on immortality, what the Jews believe about resurrection, what's the Jewish view on freedom of the will, what's the Jewish view on the Messiah, on divine providence. We have a great deal of correspondence where Manasseh is receiving letters from Dutch scholars, French scholars, English scholars, um, Christian ecclesiastics who all want, were consulting him for his expertise on Judaism, mainly because most of them had no Jews or at least no openly and uh, explicitly acknowledged Jews in their territories. Jews were not allowed in France uh, yet, nor were they allowed back in England. We'll come to that in a little bit. So Manasseh was, besides being um, a rabbi and a teacher in the Portuguese community, he was the, the public face of Judaism for many Gentiles in 17th century Europe. He was also perhaps the most important printer and publisher of Judaica. He owned the first Hebrew printing press in Amsterdam. And because of him, Amsterdam became the center of the Jewish book world. His publications were, were uh, geared both for Jewish readers and for Gentile readers. And a lot of his writings were um, originally done in Spanish and then translated into Latin. Uh, he also wrote guidebooks for Jewish life in Portuguese for members of the Portuguese community who were still seeking guidance on how to keep a, jo a, a Jewish home. Um, his, uh, there were Jewish, there were, sorry, there were Hebrew printers in the Netherlands, especially in Leiden um, and uh, Franeker, university towns, which needed Jewish printing. But Manasseh was the first uh, printer of Hebrew type in, um, in Amsterdam and the first Jewish printer in the Dutch Republic. Extremely important in the history of the book. And his books were widely sell, sold across the continent and very um, at, in great numbers at the Frankfurt Books Book Fair. He would also become a diplomat um, in 1655. Manasseh took seriously um, the messianic dictum that uh, the Messiah would not come until the Jews are scattered to all corners of the world. Well, there were several corners of the world where Jews were still officially forbidden, like England. So Manasseh decided, uh, he, he had tried to get the, a rabbi position that had opened up in Brazil when the Dutch had briefly taken over Brazil from the Portuguese. That went to another rabbi, Rabbi Isaac Aboab, who Manasseh essentially hated, and so he was glad to see, Ab he was disappointed that he didn't get the rabbi position, but he was glad to see Aboab go off to Brazil. But he never, he was always unhappy in Amsterdam. And so in 1655, he decided um, both to pursue his own messianic ideas, um, and many of his books are messianically inflected, as we'll see, but also to get out of Dodge, to get out of Amsterdam. And so he thought in 1655, I'm gonna go to England, and I'm gonna persuade Cromwell and parliament to allow for the readmission of the Jews. And at the same time, if that happens, I could become the rabbi for what was already a, a small but very hidden Jewish community in London. Um, so in 1655, he and his son take off for England. Um, Cromwell, at least according to Manasseh was sympathetic, but was never able to persuade parliament to follow along. So formal readmission of the Jews never happened. In 1657, um, his son Samuel died in London. Manasseh accompanied his body back to the Netherlands, but he himself died before he made it back to Amsterdam. And so in essence, this uh, two-year diplomatic mission was a failure, um, but nonetheless, Manasseh gets a good deal of credit uh, in the history of British Judaism for initiating uh, the readmission of the Jews. So, were they collaborators? The great Dutch painter Rembrandt and the great Dutch Portuguese rabbi Manasseh. Well, let's look at a couple of possibilities. Here's a painting from, um, oh, I guess you can, I didn't put the date up there, from around 1635 called Belshazzar's Feast by Rembrandt. Uh, Belshazzar was the son of Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar um, was responsible for the sack of Jerusalem and the, um, the destruction of the temple in the, um, in the late 16th century, uh, I'm sorry, the early 16th century BCE. 
And uh, Belshazzar, um, now the king of Babylon, was his son. And according to a story in the book of Daniel, Belshazzar was holding a feast using the utensils from the temple in Jerusalem that had been brought back to Babylon. And as the story goes in the book of Daniel, in the middle of the feasting, uh, this hand came out of nowhere and started writing on the wall a message that nobody present at the feast could understand. It was in Hebraic, it was in Aramaic with Hebraic characters. Um, and Belshazzar's wise men couldn't make sense of it. Um, and uh, there's a Talmudic debate about what was the problem? Why was it that nobody could understand the writing on the wall? And one rabbi um, in the Talmud this uh, claims that it was because it was written in a kind of code. Another rabbi says, well, it was written um, from right to left. And so, the, I'm sorry, from left to right. And so they couldn't make sense of it that way. Another rabbi says it was written in vertical columns, but with the letters all mixed up. And then one rabbi says, well, it was written right to left, but it was in vertical columns and nobody knew how to figure that out. So Daniel, somebody says, well, there's a, a member, there's somebody from among the, uh, the Israelite exiles, his name is Daniel, and he, he's very good at making sense of dreams and omens. Let's bring him in. So Daniel comes into the room and he looks up, he says, oh yes, I, the message, it reads uh, right to left. Um, and the message is mene, mene, tekel, ufarsin. And these are diminishing units of measure. Um, and so Daniel says, yeah, the message is your days are numbered. Your kingdom will soon come to an end. And this was of great messianic import in Manasseh's mind. And in his book, uh, De Termino Vitae, On the End of Life, he discusses um, moral issues about whether a person can prolong their life by being virtuous. But also at a certain point, he turns to this story. Now, one question is, where did Rembrandt get the idea that this is how the message should be written on the wall? He was not a Hebraist himself. And as you can see, he put in a good deal of care to make sure he got the Hebraic characters correctly. Who did he consult with? I think the answer is Manasseh, because in the middle of his book, uh, De Termino Vitae, he discusses the episode of Bal, uh, Belshazzar from the book of Daniel. And rather than discussing all of the possible rabbinic solutions to the puzzle, he says, here's how it was written. And that's exactly as we find it here. The book is from 1639, and the painting is from 1635. But no doubt Manasseh already had this idea in mind uh, by well before he was writing this book. So I think the likelihood that there was some kind of collaboration here, some kind of consulting of Rembrandt uh, to Manasseh, how should I portray the uh, Hebraic lettering on the wall? And Manasseh said, here's, what it, here's how it goes. This is the only, uh, of all the rabbinic uh, uh, proposed solutions, this is the only one that Manasseh uh, describes. So was there a collaboration on that? Po yeah, possibly. Manasseh himself wrote a book called Piedra Gloriosa on the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. And this too is his reading, not just of, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream and Daniel's interpretation of the dream, but of the whole Bible, the whole Hebrew Bible. The point of the story is that the messianic era is near. Can't say exactly when it's gonna happen, but the signs are all there. Uh, war, disease, plague. Um, of course, the Sabbatai Tzvi episode hadn't occurred yet. That was still a good 11 years away, 10 or 11 years away. But Manasseh had great messianic hopes. And he thought that with this book, he could spread those messianic ideas, not just to his Jewish readers, it's written in Spanish, but there would also be a Latin translation, uh, to his Gentile readers, and especially fellow Messianists and millenarians in England and France and the German lands. Manasseh's idea was that there is a stone, a rock throughout the Hebrew Bible. So he takes his start from Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Uh, in this dream, 
um, the king, the Babylonian king, dreams that there is a statue which is toppled by a stone rolling, rolling down a hill. And Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel wants an interpretation of this dream. And Daniel provides, once again, not the news that Nebuchadnezzar was hoping to hear, namely your days are numbered. Um, the stone represents the Messiah. The statue, because it's composed out of different materials in the dream, the statue represents the four kingdoms of uh, uh, Greece, Rome, uh, the, Babylon uh, the, Persians, the Babylonians, and the Persians. And these will be supplanted by the fifth kingdom, the kingdom of the Messiah. And so when the stone rolling down the hill topples the, the uh, composite statue, it's telling us that the fifth kingdom will come and sweep away all previous kingdoms. Interestingly, Manasseh said that that stone in the book Hadnezer's dream, the stone that appears in the book of Daniel, is the exact same rock. It's not just like the other rocks. It's the exact same rock that um, David has in his sling to, uh, to kill uh, Goliath. It's the exact same rock that uh, Jacob lays his head on as he's dreaming of the angels going up and down the ladder. Manasseh thought this book should have some pictures. And so what we find in some of the extant editions of the book, not all of them, but some of them, we find four etchings by Rembrandt. This is the uncut plate in one of its uh, early states, not the first state, but one of the, its earlier states, the later states would have even more detail, um, including labels on the statue. So in the upper left-hand corner, you have Rembrandt's illustration of the stone rolling down the hill and toppling the statue of um, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. On the lower left, you have um, Jacob resting his head on the stone as the angels are going up and down the ladder. On the right, you have David with his uh, sling slaying Goliath. And on the upper right, you have Daniel's vision of the beasts and the Lord of hosts in the heavens. Here's the, uh, a, later, um, a later state of the etching with the labeled statue. And here's, um, here's Daniel's vision of the beasts, uh, very closely following the text. Manasseh says himself in his preface to the book, he says, I worked very hard on coming up with images for this. It took me a lot of time, which suggests that Manasseh himself made some illustrations for the book. If he did, we have no idea where they are. These are not, these are Rembrandt's. There's no question that these are Rembrandt's etchings. Um, what happened, did Manasseh give Rembrandt guidance? Did he give him sketches that he himself had made? We have no idea. What do you notice? So now it's, quick uh, audience challenge time. What do you notice above all about this etching? Anything strike you as particularly interesting or worrisome, aside from the fact that you have a lion with its arms raised and wings in the front? Don't be shy. There you go. There's a portrait of God way up there at the top, um, right under, uh, surrounded by the hosts of the heavens. The, um, the book was actually censored by the Jewish community, and we, but we only discovered this recently. Um, we don't know why it was censored. They just said, this will not do. Now, Manasseh, had a history of getting into trouble with the leaders of the community, not, the, not so much the fellow rabbis, but the lay leaders, the Parnassim. Uh, he had been put under harem or ban himself because of his insubordination. At one point, he resented the way in which the Parnassim, uh, the, the governing board of the community, had treated his brother-in-law, and he lost his temper. And they said, you better, sh you better shut up. And he said, I'm not going to shut up. They said, well, we're going to put you under harem. We're going to ban you. He said, you're going to ban me? No, I'm going to ban you. And then they put him under the ban. Um, so he was excommunicated for a day. Um, he, had, he, he was an irascible fellow. 
But we also know that on an earlier occasion, the governing board objected to a book he was publishing and refused him permission to publish the book. So what did he do? He went to Venice. He went to the Venice rabbis and said, can I publish this book? They said, sure. So he published it. Um, again, not something that was likely to endear him to the leaders of the Amsterdam community. We don't know what they objected to. We know that they had a copy of something. We don't know whether they had a copy that included these illustrations. I suspect they did because the, every copy that we have of this book, there is no change whatsoever in the text. And so if there was an early text and then an eventual, so he, he had to have given them something printed. So there were printed copies, but none of the extant printed copies have any changes. The text and the layout is exactly the same in all of these copies. Um, and if any of them were the, the proof copy that he gave to the leaders, then what they objected to, either they didn't object to the text or he went ahead and published the text anyway, if they did object to it. But it's possible that some of the copies had Rembrandt's illustrations. The reason for thinking this is because, well, there's about, um, let me see, I have the number here. There are 23 extant copies of this book. We don't know how many he printed in the first place. Um, if there was a real collaboration between Rembrandt and Manasseh on this book, then it would have led, one would think, to the prints appearing in all of the copies that were abound in the 17th century, but they're not. Um, only, let's see, there are only 10 out of the extant 23 copies have Rembrandt's illustrations. Um, most of the other copies have no illustrations whatsoever. So if there was a collaboration, and it's hard to know whether there was, uh, the illustrations do follow very closely Manasseh's preface in which he describes the pictures that the reader will see. But Rembrandt could simply have followed those directions in creating his own illustrations. I think it's likely that there was a collaboration, but there's no documentation that supports it. Anyway, getting back to the censorship, at least a couple of extant copies, which do have illustrations, don't have Rembrandt's etchings, but rather they have illustrations by um, an artist who is possibly a man named Salom Italia. And Italia was, had come, he had been in Mantua, he was Italian, uh, Jew, ended up in Amsterdam and was a local artist and made a good living um, doing illustrations for Ketubot and for Esther scrolls. The, Extant, I think there's three or four extant copies which have these illustrations rather than Rembrandt's. They're very good, well, they're not very good copies of Rembrandt. They are obviously based on Rembrandt's illustration, but you notice someone's missing here, God. Um, so what happened? Why was there this substitution of these? Um, oh, by the way, these are engravings, they're not etchings. Uh, much better for producing illustrations for books. Etch and, and etching has a very limited lifetime. So maybe what happened was Rembrandt's uh, etching plates were wearing down, and so they had to be replaced with engravings, or the censorship by the Jewish community had an effect, namely, okay, let's use these instead. Or maybe somebody who bought the book uh, but didn't have Rembrandt's etchings but knew about the etchings said, well, I want illustrations like that and went to Salam Italia. Uh, oh, and by the way, don't put God in there. So perhaps a member of the Jewish community. Again, this is all speculation. We really don't know what happened. Um, aside from the fact that the book was replaced, some copies have Rembrandt's illustrations, some have none, some have Salam Italia's, if that's who the artist was, and that the book was censored. Um, here's my theory for which I have no evidence whatsoever. But um, let me speculate. Um, the book was dedicated to uh, a Dutch scholar named Isaac Volschus, who was a, a very learned humanist and the son of Gerard Volschus. Gerard Volschus was a very good friend of Manasseh's. 
And we know that uh, Herod's other son, Dionysius, um, studied Hebrew with Manasseh. So, and Manasseh and the Vosius family were close. And you had those kind of close friendships in Amsterdam between Jews and non-Jews. So this book was dedicated to Isaac Vosius. All the copies have that dedicatory letter. Um, and it's possible that there's a connection not directly between Manasseh and Rembrandt, but between Manasseh and Isaac Vosius, and either Isaac Vosius and Rembrandt, because Rembrandt had connections in the Amsterdam scholarly circles, or another intermediary, this man, Jan Sieks, who was a very wealthy member of the Amsterdam um, oligarchy, aristocracy. This is Rembrandt's portrait of Jan Six. If you ever go to Amsterdam, uh, make sure you get a tour of the Jan Six house. You have to make reservations in advance. It's a mansion right on the Amstel River. And if you make a reservation, you'll get a, a small private tour of the house. And in the very last room, you'll find this portrait of the first Jan Six. If you're interested about the Jan Six family, there's a movie, a film, that came out uh, three or four years ago called My Rembrandt. And uh, it focuses on people's devotion to their Rembrandt paintings. But the a story that is threaded throughout the film is a story of Jan VI the 11th, who is uh, a young man, he's an art dealer in Amsterdam, who claims to have discovered new Rembrandt. So I highly recommend this film. You can uh, purchase it online. I get no revenues from that, it's not a plug. Uh, but it's a really interesting story, both about the passion for Rembrandt paintings by people who own them, but also um, Jan VI the 11th trying to live up to the legacy of Jan VI the first. Jan VI was very good friends with Isaac Vosius. And it's possible that, uh, but also we know from this that Jan VI was connected with Rembrandt, because in addition to this painting, we have a Rembrandt um, etching of Jan VI in his study. So it's possible that Isaac Vosius, to whom the book was dedicated, had a number of copies and said, well, this book should have some illustrations. Talk to his friend, Jan Six. Isaac Vosius talks to Jan Six and says, do you know any good artists? Or can you get me connected with Rembrandt? Can you hook me up with Rembrandt? And he can do some illustrations for this book. And that's why some of the copies have Rembrandt's illustrations and some do not because those were Isaac Vosius's copies for him to give out to his friends and got connected to Rembrandt through Jan Six. So I will end on that thoroughly unsubstantiated speculation, um, but I think it's possible and that's, that's good enough. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure that speaking extemporaneously, I may have misstated a fact here or two, a date. So please feel free to correct me if I've, if I've uh, misstated something. Yes. Perhaps the first translation, the first translation of the Hebrew Bible into Ladino is actually 1556. And the reason for that is that so few Jews by that time in this world you're describing knew Hebrew. Hebrew was lost for so many. And, and actually, if you look at books from the period published uh, in, in Spanish, they're actually kind of Spanish, but kind of in Ladino, because as you know, Ladino can either be in Hebrew script or in Roman script. Right. And then by the time you see a, a work like the one you, you, you showed us, the Gloriosa Piedra, it's clear that there's an attempt to make this standard Spanish. So um, thank you. Yeah. Interestingly, Ladino was not a language in the Amsterdam Portuguese community. The language in the street and in the homes and in the, their business dealings was either Portuguese or if they're dealing with Dutch, uh, Dutch. The, uh, but you're right, um, 
especially that first generation, did not have knowledge of Hebrew. Uh, their, their preferred Bible was the Ferrara Bible, 16th century Spanish Bible. And in fact, their, the literature, the, the language of high literature for them was Spanish, not Portuguese. Although I, I do think, I'm pretty sure that the sermons that they heard in the synagogue were also in Portuguese, possibly Spanish. Uh, Rabbi Saul Levi Mortera's sermons, many of them are extant because they were collected by his students um, and they're extant in uh, Hebrew versions, but it's unlikely that he delivered them in Hebrew. If he wanted to be understood by, his, by the people. You have to wait for the mic. Thank you uh, very much. An enthralling uh, presentation and speculation. Um, I'm just interested in how far Manasseh's theory of the one stone, the one stone theory, um, it's, that's news to me. Uh, this is about as far from my field as, as one could get, but um, I'm, I, know from uh, different traditions, the, the Hebrew word Ebenezer, Ebenezer. Um, many black communities have an Ebenezer Baptist church. And I think it's usually translated into English as the stone of help. And it's uh, after the defeat of the Philistines, uh, I think in, in the book of Samuel, that figure comes up and I'm, I'm thinking of, of other stuff. Did his theory go to other stones than the one you mentioned, the ones you mentioned. Um, and is that do are there is there a tradition? Is there some kind of off the wall folk tradition of or is it like part of the, the Kabbalah and the, you know, Midrash and um, other uh, Jewish or, you know, theological or interpretive traditions uh, elsewhere? And where would I go if I wanted to learn more? So as far as I know, and I, I might ask Alan to step in and help, it's not. This is Manasseh's pet theory. Um, and it's part and parcel of, because these, this stone appears not just in the book of Daniel, but throughout uh, Tanakh, uh, the Hebrew Bible, um, it's really his messianic reading of the entire history of the Israelites and uh, entire Jewish history. Um, but I don't recall any other but you know, again, I I'm not a. No I'm not idea. A, I, think, I mean, and 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 later on, of course, Sur Yisrael will be a, one of the names for God. But that's a different name for altogether than Evan. They both mean rock or stone, but they're not the same word. So yeah. I, I'm sorry, I have. And Sur Yisrael was the name of the. So when the Dutch conquered uh, parts of Brazil briefly from the Portuguese. A lot of the uh, Amsterdam Portuguese Jews went to Brazil um, and unfortunately also became deeply entangled in the, in the uh, capture and transportation of enslaved people um, to oversee the sugar plantations in Brazil because they pretty much controlled the sugar trade across the Atlantic. And then when the Portuguese retook these parts of Brazil, uh, those Jews had to get out fast. Um, a lot of them returned to Amsterdam, which caused a big immigration problem. But um, many of them ended up in the Caribbean. So if you go to Curacao, you can visit the synagogue there and it's based, it looks very much, oh wait, I didn't have a picture of the synagogue here. It looks very much like the Amsterdam synagogue. Uh, they also ended up in Jamaica. Um, Spinoza's sister is buried in Curacao, but it's in a very bad neighborhood. So I was told, don't try to walk there. Um, his brother-in-law ended up in Jamaica, but then a lot of them ended up in New Amsterdam when it was still a Dutch colony. Um, but anyway, to go back to what I was going to say, the, the name of the uh, congregation that the Amsterdam Jews set up in Brazil was Sir Yisrael. Mm. Thanks so much for a great talk. Um, I have a question based on the very beginning of your presentation where you set out the myth, as you put it, that Rembrandt had done all these portraits of, of Jews, rabbis, et cetera, and it may not turn out to have been Jewish people at all. We don't know who it is. What do you make of 
the making of that myth, other than perhaps the obvious point that, okay, well, he lived in a Jewish neighborhood, so that kind of makes sense. Do you think there's more to it? So I think the fact that he did live in a Jewish neighborhood, but he was, um, it's not like it was a Jewish, officially a Jewish, there was no ghetto in Amsterdam. So Jews could live anywhere they wanted. But because this was a new part of the city, uh, housing was cheaper and available. Um, but I think that's part of it. Uh, also the fact that um, people, this is my view of Spinoza, I think it's also true of Rembrandt, people see in these people what they want to see. Um, there's been a, there was a lot of scholarship um, in the 19, uh, after the war in the 40s and 50s, German scholarship, which is partly responsible for this myth of, of Rembrandt um, being enamored of the Jews as a way of correcting recent German history. Rembrandt was seen as a Germanic artist. And so we can prove that anti-Semitism is not endemic to the German soul, the Germanic soul. But it's also um, because he obviously did do a lot of, of um, images based upon the Hebrew Bible. I think that naturally gives rise to this idea that he must have been enamored of the people of the Bible. Um, a difficult question is who were the, um, who commissioned all these um, biblical paintings from Rembrandt? It's possible that it was the Portuguese Jews. Um, they did collect art, big biblical art. We know from other uh, drawings and images from the time. And so it's possible that um, this painting, maybe it is uh, a marriage portrait from within the Amsterdam community. And they one of themselves portrayed perhaps as Isaac and Rebecca, um, but you know we don't know. May I add a word to that? Yeah. Uh, I, there's a, there's a, a, a very strange anti-Semitic book called Julius Langbens Rembrandt als Erzieher. Rembrandt is educator in which Langben tries to make the case that Rembrandt is a consciously Nordic, uh, quintessential Nordic painter and you know, is really represents this. And then there's sort of a counter myth that is a sort of a philo-Semitic desire to read the greats of the Western tradition in a pro-Jewish way, whether or not that's true. And I, I guess I, I think I would, wouldn't be surprised if that feeds into this. Right, everybody wants to own Rembrandt. Right. Their side. Yeah. But there is a, a, there's another side to the story here and that is Re Rembrandt was not alone in painting themes from the Hebrew Bible and even painting um, sites of Jewish worship. Um, there, the Dutch saw themselves as God's new chosen people because just as the Israelites had been freed from enslavement in Egypt, so the Dutch were freed from those idolaters in Spain, the Catholics. Um, and so they saw themselves, they saw the Dutch Republic as the new Israel, uh, Amsterdam was the new Jerusalem and we are God's new chosen people. And they needed images to feed that sense of who they were. And so you have a, not just a great number of paintings portraying the ancient Israelites, biblical scenes, but you have painters like Isaac uh, um, Jacob van Ruysdael painting the Jewish cemetery three times, Emmanuel de Witt painting the interior of the Portuguese synagogue uh, in several paintings. So there was a, a fascination, not just among artists, but among Dutch Calvinists for representations of Jews and Jewish themes, uh, ancient Israelite history because, and especially the book of Esther, because Esther's great virtue was that she hid her Judaism, but heroically revealed herself to save the people from Haman's plot. Just like these conversos who were practicing Judaism in secret had to hide themselves. And so the book of Esther was really important um, for these Portuguese Jews of Amsterdam, but it was also very important for the Dutch who like, the Jews under uh, King Ahasuerus had to be liberated by, uh, by heroic enterprise. And so the Book of Esther, I think you find more representations from the Book of Esther in 17th century Dutch art than in any other European art of the period. You just like, yeah, Al, anyone online? Rink, did you have a question? Uh, well, thank you. 
Um, I wanted to ask about the uh, dedication uh, from Manasseh's book to Isaac Fostius, uh, who was, I think, quite uh, young still at the time. So why did he dedicate that book? Was he at so bad terms with the leaders of the Jewish community that he did not dedicate the book to uh, Jews anyway? Did he prefer to uh, ingratiate himself with Christian scholars? Is there a specific reason for this? Well, I think the two reasons you mentioned are, are good ones. Uh, the fact many of his books are dedicated to leaders of the Portuguese community. The fact that this one was not indicates that he went ahead and published it despite the censorship and dedicated it to Isaac Vosius. It may also be that the Vosius family helped subsidize the publication of the book. And it may also have been something that would have made it more attractive to um, to Gentile readers, if it was dedicated to somebody as prominent as Vosius. The irony here is though that Isaac Vosius did not like Jews. Herardus Vosius and was probably a lot more tolerant of Jews. Isaac, we know pretty clearly, um, really had no love of the Jewish people. And in some of his letters belittles Manasseh himself. Um, let's make this the, uh, the last question from uh, Professor Steve. Uh, I'd like to ask a question about your final speculation. Have, do you know whether the uh, tipped in illustrations all always appear in the same place? Yes, they do. Hmm. Okay. Um, a good question. Um, try to think of this. There's, there's one case where they do not, I think. But in, um, well, let me break up your question. In all of the copies that have the Rembrandt illustrations, the um, illustrations are all, either all in the same place, but there's one copy where there are no illustrations, but there's a note that indicates, a handwritten note that indicates where the illustrations were, and they were in the same places that um, the original, originals were. Um, go back to um, the copies that have these illustrations. Um, I'm pretty certain they are in the same places, but that's something I should probably confirm. The reason I ask is that about the same time, I, I, I know that there was a flourishing trade uh, among stationers uh, who created uh, illustrations for university lecture notes in medicine. Uh, you know, medical students who weren't particularly good artists, they would um, buy these things, they'd take their own notes and then tip the illustrations in the appropriate places. Mm -hmm. It seems possible at least that these kinds of illustrations were uh, purchased separately Yes. And then, you know, used to adorn or give a kind of individ uh, individual flavor to a, a treasured book. Yeah, no, I think that that would fit in well with my Vosius Jan Six theory. Um, in fact, well, typically when you bought a book in the 17th century, you didn't buy a bound book. You bound, you bought the pages, then you had them bound. So my theory would be that Vosius had a number of copies of these unbound pages, um, had Rembrandt uh, do the illustrations and had the illustrations inserted in the same place in each copy and then had, the, had it bound. Okay. One last question from our Zoom audience. Where in the US could one see a copy of the book with illustrations? Uh, you could go to the Jewish Theological Seminary and ask them to retrieve it from Yonkers where they have their books stored. <laughs> yes, and Alan could be a personal tour of Yonkers or wherever the, I think that's where they have their offsite. Uh, Jewish Theological Seminary, there might be one at Hebrew Union College. And says that, so have the questioner send me an email because I, I have a list of where they all are. Um, most of them are in Europe. Uh, there's a, there are a couple in Paris um, there's a couple in, uh, in the Netherlands, both in Le the Leiden University ha uh, Library has two copies. Um, there's a copy without the illustrations in the Es Chaim Library of the Portuguese Synagogue. They think that it used, 
they're pretty sure that that copy did have illustrations, then someone stole them. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let's all give uh, a great thanks to Professor Stephen Nadler. Thank you. And let me, uh, let me thank everybody who's been uh, uh, attending and part of this uh, really special presidential dream course. Thank you very much.